So I'm looking for some volunteers. I sort of realized that the, the, the material on knife bases looks a little dense. So I'm looking for some volunteers to work with me to turn it into verbiage. And you know, we can have a discussion tomorrow sometime or maybe over the phone later on. Hi. Uh, because I think I'm going to make it a little simpler than I had planned to because I think it's good for folks who have reviewed the material. Uh, uh, so maybe at the end of class I'll look for some volunteers. So what I'm doing is I'm sort of posting both the projects. Um, and I think, uh, let's see, I think crowd science is okay with posting it. The Serendio doesn't want me to post it. I think both people are a little bit more comfortable with sending email to the list and not extending it beyond this class because they're a little concerned about competition and all the usual type of things. I'm actually surprised they're willing to let, let me share it with you people in the first instance. Uh, hello. Uh, because this is actually, these are parts of research projects these folks want to do with us. But the, I said, why don't we open it up to the students? Because I thought you folks might like to look at some real stuff. Uh, so uh, uh, take a look. I'll give you the simpler one first. Uh, maybe, or uh, I don't know, I can switch back and forth. Because uh, what I'll do is today, what time's about? Everybody shows up by 2.10? OK. We'll wait for everybody to get in, and then look at the two projects. And then budget time, maybe uh, the last 15 minutes of class to discuss projects, 15, 20 minutes. That's why I guess I all feel excited about real projects, right? That's why. So I'm assuming. Uh, and how is everybody finding the workload assignments and so on? Are you, I mean, there is no submission, but just for you to learn, right? Are you able to crank up and start doing things a little bit? It takes a while, it takes some effort. So uh, actually, I guess uh, Pranav said he would help out uh, with the R and other things, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Pranav, who's going to come a little uh, later, right? Uh, he can help you a little bit. Uh, we don't quite have a TA, I, I, right? So we'll have to have uh, Pranava will fill in a little bit of the role, and maybe each of you can help out, and I can work with each of you on each topic. Yeah. Hello. Uh, did uh, uh, Sil uh, Silicon Valley Center any comments? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Okay. Just a lot of connection. Uh, it's back. Oh, it's back. Okay. And you're able to see the project descriptions, right? Uh, the project, uh, the, uh, you know, for the course we are having research projects. Are you able to see the descriptions? Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, are you able to see it on screen? Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 So, by the way, uh, while we're waiting for everybody to tickle in and you're reading this. Uh, everyone, so far, easy absorption? Yes? No? Don't feel shy. It's difficult. It's difficult. Getting there? So, trying to? How many find it very slow? Raise hands. No one's found it slow so far. Okay. Yeah, I guess we have a few more people coming in, right? So we'll get their uh, feedback. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, so we're thinking of from next week having visitors come in to present uh, each of these projects so that you can directly start interacting with uh, the companies, right? So you can choose. So we have maybe this one will be presented next week and how to access data and so on. And the, the next one, uh, and, the, uh, and there's another project which uh, I believe uh, is going to be. So, so the, the projects are the following, right? Uh, uh, Okay, look at this. I'll just hold off comments so that we can do it all together in the classes at full strength, right? Otherwise, I'll be just repeating myself.
Okay. So, maybe we will just get started a little bit. Uh, uh, I was, uh, there is some, no, I don't know. okay, so it is not on the, I thought I had an email about these projects. Uh, okay. um, so, so, here is the plan for today, times 210, well, whoever is late, they will come and find out again. Uh, but uh, what we will do is, there are two uh, projects, and I believe uh, crowdscience.com is okay with my posting it on the website. But in general, I think both companies are a little bit more comfortable uh, for competitive reasons by sending email to students, but <laughs> not necessarily posting it on the website. And so please be careful that, uh, you know, I mean, the whole idea is to give you exposure. These are both research projects, and we'll probably have some more coming up. But I've said, hey, you folks might like to take a crack. So um, I, I'm assuming that you folks can spend between five to 10 hours, at least five to 10 hours a week and upwards on these projects. Right, that reasonable amount. Otherwise, they won't see much progress. Right. So, so anyone who's interested, let me know. If you're just doing simple data, then we're going to give you data, of, uh, like the data sets I've been providing. So then you can figure that out. I think. Right. So, okay. Uh, so this project, if you look at it, is primarily focused on this. Uh, so here's what's going on. There are companies which provide what are called media kits. I think I told you about this company already. Media kits. They analyze web. Uh, arrival pattern, different visitors, frequency, demographics, and all that. But they also run surveys online and use that to get a better estimate of uh, user demographics and responses on the web. And then they turn this over to publishers. So it's like providing a facility to uh, publishers to tell them what is happening on their websites. Then these publishers can sell all this to the advertisers. Right? They can say, hey, we have people who spend more money coming to my website, so <laughs> give me a higher premium, right? So that's the sort of a company. So they've got a bunch of research problems. So that's one company, okay? And the schedule here is uh, we've got the executive sponsor. We'll start off uh, today. Maybe they can come next week or the week after. A yeah, week or week two. I mean, a nice thing about a semester compared to a quarter is you have a little bit more time, I think, right? Um, and then the, the first phase is uh, 531, May 31st. And then the, pre the first checkpoint is March 17th or April 5th, so that we see what sort of progress you're making, right? Now, whether it's one person more, we'll figure out. But certainly, confidentiality, NDA, is all that kick in, right? That's one. Okay. Then the other company is uh, Serendio. Now, this should be a relatively direct application I say relatively because nothing is as simple as it looks. That's why you're taking this course. Uh, th uh, this is actually, uh, uh, you know, th they're looking at a lot of uh, data on the, uh, on the web in terms of text and other material. But they actually have done some pre-processing already. Usually, we would have to do it, which would be a lot of work for you guys. But it looks as though they've done a lot of it already. So now they're saying, can you tell me, if I look at all the stuff, how is this related, for example, with stock market values, in co uh, including commodity pricing? Right? So, it's, so the prediction we've been learning so far, right? it's almost a direct application, right? at least as a starting point. Uh, as I said, nothing looks all that simple. I always tell people, right, if you want to do research, start with simple things, and you keep going. You blast through, easy, 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 and then you get st stuck for a week. Okay? Then you get stuck for a month, then you know you're hitting research. So. Uh, unless we are overlooking literature, right? So, so that's this uh, problem, uh, uh, and you can see they would like, um, uh, you know, they're saying SPS is SAS. SAS has uh, uh, S and so on, right? But we have R, so that's the equivalent. Knowledge of text analytics, social media, and financial markets will be helpful, but not required. But I guess some of you have that knowledge, so. Okay, that's the basic uh, setup, I think. So, so, so uh, I think from next week, I suspect Serendio will be here next week. And um, the other company, Crowd Science, the following week. Now, the other thing is, uh, I was talking to Ray, uh, uh, Professor Larson, that uh, we may start having some presentations. I said in the course, we said we'll also have presentations for, by speakers from industry, right? Now, it's a little bit of a long haul for them to come from Silicon Valley to here. Uh, but we, I also talked to a, a lady who's been very good at uh, doing healthcare analytics, very articulate. And she's helping Stanford with some things. So, so, so uh, uh, this is in the healthcare analytics because, because we said we'll look at uh, advertising, and Jimmy will be with us again soon. Yeah, I guess those of you who saw him during the first lecture, uh, he's a little tired of other things. And then uh, we, we'll get probably other people. Uh, then you're seeing these sort of uh, companies. 
then we'll get uh, healthcare analytics, and then um, also uh, there is locally in Berkeley somebody in social media. So and he actually ran a division of this big marketing company WPP. So and he can give a nice flavor to a little bit more broader, I think. So we are thinking of thinking of having this in the three to four hour uh, you know window, so you start getting some industrial exposure. But what it means is the class time available to teach you all the details is coming down. So we have to figure out how much of it is enough for you to learn some substance and then whether we need some makeup or you know, like uh, more a tutorial session or something like four to five or so. We need to figure out some of that, I think. Okay? Okay. Now, uh, but, uh, before I get started then for the rest of class, and we can, uh, if you uh, look at this, we'll put it up on the website or send you email so you can review it at your leisure um, and tell me which of these you are interested in. And as I said, I think typically companies probably expect five to ten hours a week at least minimum. But you know, the more you work, especially you want to get jobs in this area or you know, whatever, right? I mean, then you know what it takes. I don't have to explain to you. You're all pretty self-motivated people. Now, uh, today, uh, my, my quick question is I was going to co cover uh, nearest neighbor classification. Remember, we talked of prediction. Prediction, you have lots of independent variables. But the one dependent variable is a continuous variable, right? And we've covered that with multiple variables. And also the output could also be multivariate. Uh, and then we are now looking at the classification, which is looking at the outcomes are uh, discrete classes, right? And then we have some uh, in input variables, right, which could be continuous. For example, money you make, your age, whatever. And then are you likely to buy this or not buy this? Or will you buy a, a, a PC, will you buy a laptop, will you buy a projector, whatever, right, classes. So that's what we are doing right now. Now, I did logistic regression, but we rushed through it last time. So maybe we should go a little bit uh, more peacefully, give a, get in a few more concepts, and then get into, naive, uh, into nearest neighbor uh, classification, and then naive base. Is that OK? Now, naive base is a challenging. Uh, so so all, the problem with all these things in data mining, sometimes it's so easy. You want what to, what's there to learn? But if you really want to learn it properly, you want to, my god, what am I going to do, right? So it sort of it's, it straddles the two, right? So uh, you know, I, I, what I can do is to start doing some of the simpler things, and then we figure out uh, whether it's too easy for you, and I can speed up, uh, uh, right? Uh, and, and then uh, we can figure out how much of it should be in class, or uh, this four or five extra session, or some other session. Right? So let me know because it's a little difficult for me to gauge exactly what you can and cannot handle right now. Okay, so. Now, uh, as I told you, remember, I always uh, promise lunches and dinners and uh, good things as long as you give me the right answers, right? So um, what did we discover about logistic regression last time? We didn't finish up, but uh, what did we discover? Any, anyone willing to bite the bullet and say yes? Very quickly, everybody remembers beer preference? Right. So, by the way, I think Marco had this question. Hello, hi. I had this question of, uh, well, uh, how do you actually do this, right? Well, we'll show you how to do it today. Okay. I mean, uh, between one of the two lectures. So, so everybody remembers that we are uh, that logistic regression. Uh, non, uh, logistic regression is about the following: about predicting whether I like light beer or dark beer. Yeah. Uh, no, you can go beyond that. You can go to multiple classes, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. Yeah, yeah, it's a starting point. You can build out any key classes. Uh, by the way, any questions on hard problems, ask uh, Ray, because he's used logistic regression. So it's always good to know the ins and outs. You know, I, I've often found you can always look at some theory. Only when you've tried it out yourself and you've actually developed new theory can you really talk exactly about all the details that go on, right? So I'll, I'll tell you. What. Okay. So, so, so we also said, uh, by the way, we also told you we use logistic regression rather than uh, regular prediction because for all these reasons, right? All the nice model requirements of uh, prediction don't hold when you get to logistic regression, correct? Okay. So, so uh, here's where we were, right? Very quickly. Now, we look at this, uh, remember this, that we say the probability one means light beer, zero means uh, dark beer or regular beer. And the answer depends on your classifier, right? And the classifier has a set of properties uh, x, right? The features of the problem, right? By now, everybody knows the term features. Okay. 
And then let's, we are going to multiply, you have a vector of features. Everybody knows linear algebra, so this language is fine, right? So I look at the inner product of my coefficients w and my feature uh, uh, values of variables uh, 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 x, right? So that means I'm weighting each of the features by some weight vector. And I then take it to the power of e to the power of minus wx, and I have this transformation function, right? So what this is giving me is the probability of a data point which has got feature values x. It's telling me what is the probability that this is a light beer, or y equals 1, correct? So I have two classes. y equals 1 is one class. y equals 0 is a second class. I'm given the data point value x. Somehow or the other, I have w right now. Let's say God gave it to me. So right, uh, omniscience, I attribute to the Lord. So you take the inner product, compute wx, uh, which is a scalar, right, inner product, and take 1 plus 1. Uh, you divide 1 by 1 plus e to the power of minus wx. You get this transformation, right? Why is that? Because we said you're mapping anything from minus infinity to plus infinity to 0 to 1. So it's a probability of is it this class or that class? If it's not this class, it's got to be the other class. Everybody with me? So and uh, if the first class is 1 by whatever else, the other one is e to the power of minus wx by the, the same expression, right? Uh, OK. Now, so are we done? Uh, is life happy? I can, uh, given a set of data points, can I go off and start uh, figuring out whether they're light beer or uh, regular beer? I gave you a formula. Is life happy? Do you believe me? Yes? Ah, it won't even give you the odds yet. What is missing? We don't know W. I said God gave it to us, yes. I mean, in our dreams, uh, perhaps, but in reality, we've got to work hard at our, ourselves, right? So, so the whole issue here is now, we know this is a model, it sort of makes reasonable sense, but we need to get W. And so clearly, like everything else in life, in data mining, we get W from past data, and we use it to predict future classes. Right. So, um, and remember, we looked at the so-called uh, uh, log odds, right? We looked at the probability of, given this data point, right, all the values, we're looking at how likely is it that it's a 1 or a light beer versus 0 or a regular beer. And we take the log of that, right? And that log of that is simply take the data point and take, uh, weight it by the coefficients coming from your weight vector, which we have not yet estimated. That's it. Right? And if, when will you say it belongs to class 1? y equals 1. If it's greater than the number first? Then, then the number, especially 0. Right? That's where uh, uh, depends. Uh, because if you s assume symmetry oh. in the cost, yeah. then the number is 0. If it's not symmetric, that number may not be 0. But so it's a nice threshold rule, right? Just compute this nice weighted value, see whether it's greater than or smaller than some number, assign it. Bang. Easy, right? OK. Now, so we, we went through all this, right? That this is a sort of take maps things from minus infinity to plus infinity to 1. We did all that, right? So, and this is a little proof that if you want the, the expected value uh, of the, uh, the error of misclassification, right? Of uh, a 0 or a 1 or a 1 or a 0, correct? Uh, then you want wx to be positive, right? That's, we went through that la last time, right? Everybody with me? No problem? Right, but this is where the fact the costs are the same was used, right? We're assuming that L01 is a loss when the 0 is classified as, uh, mis mistakenly as a 1. The cost is the same as the, uh, misclassifying a 1 as a 0, which is L10, correct? Everybody with me so far? Clear? OK. So anyway, so that's where we are at. OK, now, how are we going to start this problem? And I'm going to give you the outline of the steps. If I'm going too fast, let me know. Because I sort of thought that you folks want to be practical. You don't want to be, I mean, you'd like to know how things are done, but you don't want to be unduly bogged down in algebra. And you're all smart enough to go read the algebra. And if you have difficulties, you'll come back and get me to explain the algebra to you. Is that a reasonable statement? OK. Uh, so, so what we do is, are all of you familiar with the notion of a likelihood function? Have you thought, seen it anywhere? So here's the point, right? 
Let's assume I see a set of data points, right? So I, I see observations x, the features, and I see some result, right? Y. So the whole idea is how likely am I to see these data points, right? So if I can find a, for the, the, this weight vector w, which maximizes the probability of my finding this data, right, together, that means I'm fitting the right function, correct? Because I'm, essentially I'm observing it, I'm explaining it, and I pick a function or a value which explains this, right, what I'm observing, correct? That's what a likelihood function is intuitively. Everybody with me? So I, I'm already observing this. How do I f pick those um, features, I mean, those um, parameters under my control for a classifier which maximize the likelihood of what I'm observing being true, right? But that's for a classifier. But even if it's not a classifier, I just observe some data. I want to find some parameters. What parameters best explain the data, right? That means whatever I observe, the probability of seeing that is maximized, then that means it's the maximum likelihood is really telling, uh, m ensuring that what I observe is very consistent with reality, right? That's what it is. So here, what we will do is we'll look at the probability of the data, which is x, the feature, y, the, uh, the out, uh, x is like the input feature, y is the output uh, variable, y, resulting y. And we are saying, can I choose a w which maximizes the probability of seeing these x and y sets, right? That's a simple question. And uh, now, if you take the logarithm, then, you know, there's a, uh, it's a monoton tree, right? Everyone's familiar that log is a monoton function? No problem? Okay. So, I mean, why it's convenient? If you have something which is a product, it becomes a summation, right? And that's why you do that. Okay. So now, let's see. I'm just trying to see uh, a lot of algebra. Let's see. see. Okay. So, uh, how much are you folks up to some algebra? <laughs> are you up to it? Yeah? I see the nodding of heads. Yeah. The nice thing about writing versus using PowerPoints I'm forced to go slow, so I can't skip steps, and you can follow me. That's the risk of uh, PowerPoints, I think, right? So uh, go slow, is necessary. So you have this training uh, example. I'm going to use my pointer on my screen. So uh, I, by the way, our goal is to get an example, right? Because we want to show this so that you know how to solve the problem. So you've got each training example, xi. And by the way, what were the xi's? Let's always relate concrete things, right? Uh, let's see here. What we had was gender, marital status, income and age, right? And then we were trying to predict light or regular. Everybody with me? So your X size, every data point, tells you male or female, married or unmarried, what's the income and what's the age, right? And then the output is always the YI is, is a one if it's a light beer, regular if they like the regular beer. Okay. Now, so they're all drawn from the uh, distribution PXY. We're assuming uh, it's in, uh, independent identically distributed. Everybody familiar with this? Anyone who's not? You're not. Okay, independent identically distributed. So if every data point, you assume the X size are coming from X1, X2, X3, they're all coming from exactly the same distribution. And similarly, the YI or the combination. Because it could be that maybe uh, I am switching, if, if people today are coming into the pub and they're all Irish and they suddenly become German, then the preferences could change dramatically, right? Or Indian. Indian probably light beer, right? Not too heavy. So German, let's go for the heavy beer, right? Uh, so, so, so you could have a transition, right? So it's confusing. But you want to make certain that it's sort of the same distribution. Otherwise, you need to use some other model. Okay? So. Now, uh, so we can write this as, look at, uh, so you have many data points, right? We want to use all the data points, not just one data point, right? So we say, hey, how likely is it I'm seeing this person with all these characteristics of age and gender and income and all that and a preference of beer, and the next one and the next one and the next one, right? We are putting them all together, and we want to use all the data. So now we take the logarithm of the product of seeing all of it together, but because these are independent, they're identically distributed, but they're also independent. So whenever in, uh, probabilities are independent, we can take the product, right? So what happens to one customer is independent of what happens to the other one, so you can take the product. So we take the product of all these things, 
And all these numbers depend on this, uh, uh, when you think of classifying or fitting, they depend on this parameter w, right? So we get this nice uh, summation here, right? So our goal then is to maximize this expression, right? Find a w which maximizes the expression. Everybody with me? But then I have to add all the data points together. So the product here becomes a summation when I take the log, right? Clear? No problem? Okay. Now, we also assume that the x value, whoever comes in, the, they, you know, the people, their, their characteristics don't depend on the classifier you're using, right? Because w is a function of the classifier you're using, right? So they don't, the value is independent of that. So you can dump this, so this expression, x i w, depending on w, it doesn't depend on w, so you can dump that. So all you care about is optimizing this summation, right? It's made easier. Am I skipping a little too quickly or are you okay? Yeah, wide awake? Okay. Now this is where the algebra is a little tr tricky because of notation. So by the way, no mathematics is difficult. The only problem with mathematics is just getting familiar with symbolism. And that's what is hard to uh, keep track of, I think, right? So here, we're gonna say the probability that given any data point x and our uh, uh, weight vector w that we need to choose, if the, pro if the probability y equals one, that is a light beer, is given by gxw, right, that expression, and that's this logistic transformation, one by, this is called the logistic transformation, right, logit function, one by one plus e to the power of minus wx, right? And we'll call this thing y hat. Now, since the probability is, is uh, any, any given person, which is who the data point x, either person drinks light beer or dark beer, so the probability of y equals zero xw has to be one minus gxw or one minus y hat, right? Because if you're either a light beer drinker or a, uh, or a dark beer drinker or regular beer drinker, so the probability of being a light beer is y hat, then the other probability has to be one minus y hat. No problem? Easy? Okay, so we just say that the probability that given the data point i, the, the probability of the output being one or light beer is y hat, or uh, y, one minus y hat otherwise. Okay, no problem? Okay, by the way, let's fix the typo. Uh, now I know why I didn't fix it. I'll go back to it. Okay, not, let's not fix it. Okay. So, so that means if I have, uh, all of you are fam familiar with uh, binomial distributions, multinomial distributions, right? Bernoulli trials. Anyone who doesn't know Bernoulli trials? No, everybody does. Uh huh? What's the Latin? Bernoulli. Bernoulli. B-E-R-N-O-U-L-L-I. Bernoulli. B -E -R -N -O -U -L -L -I. Bernoulli. Yeah, I guess my pronunciation is probably a little different than yours. Okay. Uh, so the, pro the probability that the uh, i's data point, right? Uh, sorry, this is wrong. Uh, I take that back. Yeah, no, that's correct. So if the i's data point, uh, so y hat, I say if y i is one, look at this expression. If the i data point was a light beer, y i is one, right? So what's the probability of my i point being a light beer, y hat? Now on the other hand, let's assume it ended up being a dark beer. Then the, the then uh, the uh, dark beer is uh, y i equals zero. So this term doesn't occur. But in this term, I have one minus y hat to the power of one minus zero, which is one minus y hat, right? So this is a nice expression. It just expresses what we wrote down here compactly, correct? Succinctly. So our uh, objective learning function then is, I sum up all these terms, right? And so the log of this is this expression, probability of yi given xi w is y hat, correct? So I log of y hat, but I also need to look at the, uh, but I had yi on top here. So in other words, I take this expression, I'm summing this expression, log of p y i hat, but that is the logarithm of this expression. So I get yi into log y hat i plus one minus yi log one minus y hat i. So let's try to understand what these mean. For every data point, yi is either one or zero. It's one if it's a light beer, if it's zero, if it's a dark beer, right? And y hat i, 
remember we let me get rid of this y hat here was merely the probability y equals 1 given x w right that's 1 plus e to the power of minus w x everybody with me okay so uh, this is algebra <laughs> okay so I have an objective function and my, what is my goal now my goal is to solve for the value of w which optimizes this right because I only have one thing everything else is data x is x i is data y i is data so the only thing here so y i here is just data if I look at y hat that's the only unknown thing here right but what is y hat y hat is 1 plus 1 by uh, 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 1 plus e minus w x x is known to me every data point is known right so the only thing I don't know is w so my goal here is to somehow compute or estimate w and how do I estimate w that means all these this whole expression depends on w and I want to differentiate this whole expression with respect to w which is a vector and I want to find the optimal w now if this function is you all know that if you have a convex uh, if I have a concave function if I uh, set the derivative equal to 0 then the, by solving for it I get that uh, that parameter value which gives me the maximum right if it's concave so I have to first verify it's concave correct so it looks as though all of you have had a course in linear algebra and one in optimization is that a reasonable statement no so when I when I make the statement well if it's concave if I differentiate it set it to 0 you get the optimum you nodded your head uh, uh, it's because you wanted to look nice to me or did you know it okay, is hard okay no no but my statement that if a function is concave uh, that you know okay 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 this is just a word forget words this is easy okay 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 um, so so uh, so the, I mean all of you know sort of a chain rule for differentiation right so may I do you want to take it on faith or <laughs> that this is the expression and you can check the algebra later on so this is the gradient right you look at the function and you look at the gradient of it with respect to each of the parameters right and so we get an expression right here you see that so uh, if you check all this <laughs> you get the uh, the expression that the gradient of all this is given by take every data point take the the actual value that uh, occurred whether it was actually a light beer or a dark beer and y hat i is what you predicted so you look at the difference between what it was versus what you predicted using a given value of w so in one iteration you assume a value of w if you if i assume a value of w then i can predict then I can predict what y hat is, right? Because y hat only requires knowing w. The data point value x, x is known, correct? So if I start by assuming a value of w, then I can I know what the predicted value y hat i is, right? My, and I also know what y is actually from observing the data. And I know what the, the feature values x i are, right? So I have a gradient value which I compute from this. And if I have a gradient and I keep on updating each time, I go to the optimal solution, right? For all of you, you know, if I have gradient search, that's the scheme I apply, right? So you have a scheme where I start with the value of the coefficients being zero. I start with the initial direction being zero. And I keep on updating where the error is the difference between the original actual value of the variable yi which is 1 or 0 minus what I predicted and the direction I update by, by adding this uh, error value and, I, if and then I take w and I take the original value of w which is 0 I add eta which is some, uh, some small coefficient I use times the direction and I keep on updating each time till I go to the optimum value clear? No problem? Okay. Let me tell you, uh, it was only about the second or third time I was teaching, I realized that no textbook gave this very clearly out. This little one is a little book, uh, a little piece in a book, so we needed to clean it up. So now you know how to write an algorithm to do uh, pre uh, prediction using logistic regression. Right? Okay. Everybody with me? No problem. Yeah? Okay. Uh, no one's feeling shy. Okay, we're going a little slow, but methodically. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. 
Uh, you know, do I say you keep going instead of convergence? Uh, uh, you are Mach. Yeah. Mach, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Yeah. How can you guarantee that? You know the way, um, you know, the error is like yi minus y hat i, so it's always going to be non zero. Uh huh. That's so why you're going to keep going down to the states where y, where w is just popping up, up and down around. So, so that's. Yeah, yeah. That's one, yeah. That's, it's a heuristic way of doing things. If you, otherwise, you can have the eta be, you know, uh, keep converging towards zero is another way. There are all these schemes, right? So which that's optimization, but uh, so so yeah. So so in some sense, uh, but that's a good point. So each of these things come and talk to me. Often, very good question. Good, I like that. He's wide awake. Okay. Now, I. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, so um, now, the question that uh, uh, Akshay asked was. Well, do I need to, can I only deal with uh, two classes, or can I deal with more classes? Okay, well, here we show you how to deal with more classes. Okay, let's take, you know, the way, by the way, whenever you think of generalize something, when you want to generalize something, what do you do? You first ask the question, why did it work? If you know why it worked, then you can see can I fudge and make more complicated situations look sort of similar. Well, if so, great. If not, Either I give up or I say maybe I can do something else to make it work, right? So if you think of why this whole thing works, let's go back and see why it all works. It works because if I look at this, right? If I look at these ratios, the, one, the denominator cancel off, so I just get this ratio of 1 and E minus Wx, right? So you see the relative odds of either this happening or that happening, right? So somehow, my impression is, if the denominator could be complicated, but all the numerators are sort of looking similar, right? Life might be happy, right? So instead of, so if I've got three, maybe instead of e to the power of minus wx, can I get some variant of that, right? That's the question. So let's see how we can do that. So voila, here's the trick. Instead of a fixed w1, for every class, if I had W1, W2, different weights, right? And so I think of a situation when the last, the kth, capital K, the last, I have K classes, capital K classes. And you know, let's think of each of the classes, not the last one, but think of each of the others, right? Each of them have probabilities the same way, e to the power of minus W1K, W2K, W1X, e to the power of W2X, and so on, right? So then, certainly looking at these ratios, you want something to look like this, the log odds, right? So if you do that, then the probability of any little k, means any arbitrary class, will be all those exponentials divided by 1 plus the summation of all these probabilities, right? Right? And, and the last class, just like before, it doesn't have an exponential, but just a 1. Remember, in the previous cases, one class had a 1 in the numerator, and everything else had an exponential, right? Well, here, that's, you still have the base class still looking happy in 1. The other guys are a little bit more complicated, e to the power of something. But otherwise, everything goes through. Right? So I'm not proving it, but I'm sort of showing you roughly what it looks like, right? Credible, plausible? OK. Okay, so so we did the minor example. All of you are happy with this? You know how to do this? No problem. Remember it? Yes. Do you have minors? The number of years they were exposed to coal, uh, and then the number of severe cases, and so the proportion of severe cases y you can compute, right? Probability. So, can you see the features, years, number of severe, you know? Okay. Uh, so, here notice that the proportion of uh, severe cases, uh, it, what we're doing is y is computed by the number of severe cases by the number of minors. Right? So, we are computing the probability from the data. But number of years is the only feature we are using here, nothing else. Number of years of exposure. Right? So, we, the, th the last column, y, is computed by dividing the second column by the third column, correct? 
And now, uh, when we do a function, you can see the years of exposure on the uh, y-axis, which is the actual data, and the whether people had a severe case of uh, health or not, which is why on the right-hand side, right, the proportion, which is the probability, right, of somebody falling ill. Now, uh, in the second plot on the right-hand side, on that re real, actually, what happened, we overlay our model, which is a smoother curve, right? But the smoother curve is pretty much fitting the original curve, right? So it looks as though it's a pretty good fit using logistic regression, right? Now, as I've told you before, uh, for those of you who watch BBC productions, you can see coal miners, exposure, people dying in the mines. Uh, so, so this is a pretty quantitative uh, perspective on life from that. Okay? Okay. Now, from your viewpoint, what would you like to use logistic regression for in the internet world? Getting away from unhappy subjects such as coal miners, what happy subjects would you like to get to? If you had to, now that you have a model, a model is like having a hot rod, right? You can hit the roads. So what would you like to do? You know how to optimize it, right? So let's see, we've got, who is the earthquake specialist here? Not yet, Pradeep. Pradeep is an earthquake, right? So the earthquake guys want to know. So their question is, if I see a building, if I have an earthquake, will it crash or not? Or what is the probability of crashing, right? So you can start looking at the data you have to see what is the likelihood of, and they run lots of tests. So what they do is they don't want a building to crash. So they actually wait, and they run some tests to see will it crash or not. So you could actually start looking at the data, right, to see at what point does it start crashing, right? So that's, that's one interesting example. Uh, any other examples you folks want to think about? or? Uh, 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 before I, uh, while you're thinking, I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about a nice example or what you may want to work on or some of the, any of the problems where, uh, in crowd science, I'm going to describe a problem in a moment and tell you how you could use uh, this prediction of class in a moment. Uh, I'll do that. So, but I want you to start thinking. This is supposed to be, originally it was supposed to be a seminar class, not just lecture class. So you're supposed to have industry speakers, professors sometimes lecture, although I've been lecturing quite a bit. And then you folks are supposed to come and talk and supposed to engage. That's the deal, right? Okay. Now, the other part of it is W hat. Is it a, is it a constant or is it a random variable? What is W hat? That's my estimate for W, right? My weight vector. So is it a constant or is it a random variable? Okay, so let me tell you one thing. If you, in all estimations of the sort, all these are random variables, right? We don't know what the value is. We are guessing. We are an estimated based on data, and, and and the estimate depends on the data sample. So it's a random variable, right? Now, if I'm given a random variable, and I I, I fudge it and say it's a normal uh, random variable, it must have a mean value. Okay, we use that. So. Is that enough then? We, we estimated W hat, right? Which is a approximation for the weight W. And we can do a logistic prediction. Are we happy? Life is happy? We stop there? No. Okay. Uh, Akshay by now knows when Professor Keller says something, there must be a reason. It should be suspicious. Okay. So what do you think we should look at, Akshay? See? <laughs> Rule one, when professor projects something, talk about what is projected. Try it on the money. Right? Right? Right. So, so, so basically, we have a random variable, so we're using it to predict something. But let's assume the variance or covariance is miserable. Then the prediction must be miserable too. Why the hell would I be using it, right? So, so you folks must think about it, right? Even if I use a normal approximation. Right? So, so here's a situation where I think in this particular case, you have the covariance value, right? So, so the only reason I bring it up is, any time we have any prediction, and all of data mining is about prediction, and we're fitting these coefficients, every coefficient is a random variable. That means it has a distribution. And we're always asking for, we made some assumption about this random variable. It's normal, it, it, it's zero, it's not zero, right? In hypothesis testing, right, we were saying p-value, is it zero or not, right? So each of these assumptions must be tested, right? 
So in this particular case, you have predictor W, and then you have uh, the different values, and you compute odds ratio, confidence intervals, all these, right? Because once you have a random variable, you can do all this, right? And all of you have done uh, uh, regression or some such course in the past, right? So clear, no difficulties, no problem? Yeah? Okay. So, but, but don't try to uh, make me happy now, because you'll be working on projects, right? You, you need to be learning, right? So, so, it's so, by the way, one thing I might tell you, all of you, because uh, uh, what do you think the, uh, no, so my comment to you is based on learning. So, in learning, let's go to a professor. What do you think a, learn, a professor's most important characteristic should be? And of course, this applies to students as well. Any good answer? Dinner. Okay, uh, T, 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 yes, that's a good answer. So, yeah, that's a good uh, feature. No, actually, you could even get a dinner, because really, when you teach, you want to understand what are you following, what are the students following or not, right? So that's a good answer. But I'm looking for a slightly different answer, but we still get dinner. But I'm still looking for my dinner uh, answer. That's also good. Okay, one more. All good answers. I'm still looking for one more answer. Okay, I will tell you, if I'm not willing to be stupid and say, hey, I'm ignorant or I don't follow something, then I cannot learn, right? Correct? As a professor. So when I try new areas, I am stupid. I don't know what the hell it is about. So you go learn, right? So that's one thing. So even for you, so the reason I make this point is, if you don't follow something, you should stop me and say, I don't follow or can you help me understand this idea better or not, right? Then your time is spent well, mine is well, spent well. Okay, so, so I'm assuming all of this is clear to you. If, any, if not, or going too fast, too slow, please come back. So anyway, so now we'll start speeding up a little. So in, in, when we start looking at the parameters, we have W, uh, if you think of W, right? If I only have two variables, right? actually I have one variable, right, in, in this example, number of years exposed to coal, or mine. So uh, you always have, when you have this, I always have an intercept w naught hat plus a value w1 hat, which is a constant in sitting in front of number of years of exposure to coal mine, right? So now, let's assume I increment. So that's this eta hat xi. If I increment the, the number of uh, the, the regressor or the independent variable xi by a unit, right? Then I get w naught hat plus w1 hat into xi plus 1, right? So I look at the difference between both these. I get w1 hat, correct? So the interpretation of W1 hat, which is the log odds, is the increase in the probability of success associated with a one unit change in the value of the predictor variable, right? I'm using an independent or predictor variable to make a prediction. If I change that by a unit, how much of an improvement in I, do I get, right, in this odds ratio? And that's what is coming uh, from the, uh, from the question WI, right? Correct? So, so, so you understand? Yeah, Marco? On the previous slide, you said W0 hat and W1 hat. I just want to relate that back to the minus example. So W0 hat would be the number of years? Uh, no, no, no. W1 hat would be the coefficient. See, here we had uh, this uh, exponential 4.7965 minus something, something. So this is W1. This thing is W1. And this is W0. The intercept is W naught, and the uh, the gain coefficient is W one. Right. So when we are denoting that, uh, why W naught is not that intercept? Uh, coming, come again. Why W naught is constant in both cases when we are adding the unit? Ah, why? Why do you have that? So you're asking why is the okay? So issue is why is it that W one hat alone is showing up? That's just the way it is. That's the point. That's the interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> right, so both are required for the curve, but for the interpretation of that particular thing. But intuitively, uh, you know, what you might say is, okay, let's maybe another way of looking at it. So, so let's assume I divided this entire expression by this, this e to the power of this, just this constant, right? So that constant will go here, it will go here, and you will just have something into x here, right? So, so those constants are not shifting things, that's why. 
I mean, you look at the ratios. That, that's the reason. See, that constant keeps canceling off when you look at ratios, and that's why it doesn't matter. Right? Because you want x to be there, right? So, so the only way x shows up is when the constant cancels off. That, that's what's going on. OK. So, right? So the, uh, the odds ratio of uh, x taking this, uh, you know, i plus 1 versus being i is exponential w1 hat. Right? So new pneumoconiosis. Yeah, I got it. So y hat is given with this expression. Y hat is a prediction, right, of whether somebody is going to be severely ill, right, after x years of exposure. And so the log ratio is 1.10. That means every uh, year of exposure, the additional uh, the odds of contracting the, uh, this uh, severe thing increase by 10%. Right? That's why you use it. So clearly you can see in mortality, in insurance, there's a nice function to use, right? But a lot of things have this, right? If, if bugs are more likely to occur in software because of increased interaction, if uh, yield deteriorates because of exposure to contamination, many of these models, right, hazard models, could benefit from this, right? Okay. Um, let's see, how are we doing on time? Okay. So, so by the way, is this the right pace for you people? I'm going to show a few more things, and then I know so, uh, because last time I know was it Marco or Evan or somebody said, uh, well, you know, you, you're, you're sort of quickly sort of showing us the points and going on, but can you sort of show us the pieces? That's why I'm, I'm doing this, right? So I'm trying to balance it off. So, yeah, uh, very quickly, uh, and this is something you should do. Uh, all of you are familiar with sum of squares error. How many people are not raise hands? Don't be shy. Okay with it? Okay. So if you think of it, right, our objective function here is maximum like, uh, uh, maximizing this uh, likelihood, right? It's not least squares error. So if you have least squares error, then uh, you, the sum of squares is always an important uh, measure, right? So because we're always asking, if I build a model, how good is the model? How good a fit is this model based on this uh, fitting these parameters to the actual reality? That's the question we're always asking, right? I mean, you can never have a perfect model. So you're, you can only ask, how much does it fit? The, so in other words, if I have the data, I don't go beyond this, how good a model can I get? And you can still not get a perfect fit, right? Think of it, if I'm using a straight line for all sorts of points, I can't get a perfect fit. But the least squares estimate is the best fit. In terms of, the le uh, I say here an objective function saying I draw a straight line, I've got points, the difference between any point and a point on the straight line is something. I want to minimize that error, the square of the error. So I have an objective function which I'm minimizing the error in some sense. But in our particular case, it's not least squares, but it's this uh, uh, log likelihood ratio, uh, function we are uh, uh, minimizing, uh, right? So because of that, or ma maximizing the log likelihood. So the equivalent of the, 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 the least squares estimation error, or the sum of squares error, is what is called deviance, which has this particular formula, right? So you can see the number of uh, data points, uh, and you can see the, the type, yi is the type of beer or whatever, right, or whatever category you're predicting. So it's an expression which is a little different from the one we are used to, but it tells you how good is your fit, right? Now. What is the base? Let's assume we didn't do any of the sophisticated stuff. We decided to be naive. Uh, by the way, is naivety stupidity? No. Right? Naivety is not stupidity. So here, you make the simplest possible assumption. Right? The simplest uh, naive assumption is, I have a lot of data points, and of all these points, I have 100 people. Let me figure out how many of them care for light beer. So, uh, maybe in Germany, it's 70 out of 100. Bang. Everybody I'll declare is interested in dark beer. In India, 70 are interested in light beer. Everybody I declare to be interested in light beer. So lots of errors, but I don't care. That's my base. Okay? So the, 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 you always want to compare this error that comes through with the errors uh, which accrue when you have a naive model. Correct? So that tells you how much 
this model is helping you compared to a naive model, right? Ah, uh, let's hold off to the next class. I, I, I'll get into that a little bit. Uh, yeah, because I didn't explain what is saturated. I, I didn't explain any of this. So, so for, for right now, let, let this stay and just look at this expression. Yeah, but I'll, I'll come back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, all of you familiar with the with the t test, the f test, f distributions? Okay. Let's start. Everybody familiar with normal random variables? Okay, if I square a normal random variable, what is the distribution? Hmm? Chi squared. Okay, if, what is the sum of chi squared distributions? Chi squared. Okay, if I have a normal divided by chi squared, is it anything? Okay, what is the square root of uh, uh, chi squared distribution? Just by just a square root, or if I have a normal divided by chi squared, normal divided by square root of chi squared, what is it? So these are things you should become very familiar with. It's a piece of cake, and if you have a little bit of difficulty, I'll be happy to guide you, right? Because you keep on encountering them, right? See, why is that? Purely for reasons of ease of <laughs> analytics. People for continuous variables, we always use normal and and variance of the that I'm describing. And for anything discrete, what models would you use? Binary? Bernoulli? Multinomial? So, so I don't know whether you folks are familiar or you need a little primer on some of these. So let me know, OK? OK. So, so, so anyway, so, so, so um, in the if you think of the F test for a linear regression model, do any of you remember that? F test? Do you remember sum of squares? Sum. So do you look at some ratios of sum of, uh, um, um, sum, sum of the SSR, um, sum of the regression divided by sum of uh, the error, SSR to SSE ratios, right? So if you look at the sum of squares, each of them is normal. And the sum of normals is sum of normals. A normal square. If you take normal square, it's chi squared. Sum of chi squares is chi squared. Ratio of chi squares? OK, you do get dinner. Good, good, good. Yeah, you, you do get it. Good, good. I mean, but, but the point is, it doesn't matter whether you got the, uh, uh, in this case is right, but it doesn't matter whether you get it right. Roughly speaking, you're seeing where I'm leading up to, right? The reason is in all these, I have a random variable. I'm trying to figure out, hey, if, if I assume it's a zero value, I know the distribution, it's got some value which is far out, very, very unlikely, right? Very low value. Then I know, hey, this is not zero. That means this coefficient is valid, right? That's all the idea, right? OK. So the equivalent of that, but that was in the case of a linear regression model with least squares prediction and so on. But here, with the objective function we have, the equivalent of that is if you look at this deviance, right, which we computed, and you multiply that by n minus p, n is the number of samples, p is the number of the predictor or independent variables, right? <laughs> so like this degrees of freedom sort of idea we have. And you divide the deviance by n minus p, then if that's significantly larger than 1, that means the current model is not valid, right? So now we are saying here's logistics. So what are we doing? We did everything about prediction, linear prediction, with least squares. Now we are switching to logistic regression. So just like in the old case, we said when is the model valid, when is it not model, uh, when is it not valid? We are giving you all the tests for that, right? Okay. So let's see here. So uh, oh, uh, let's see. I'm just going to see. I'm going to get you something practical. We are, uh, so the question is always takes um, hmm, case study. Okay. So my question is, how patient are you people? It'll take a while to get through all the ideas. Do you have the patience? Yeah, I see some vigorous nodding of heads. How about everybody? Any anyone wants any other sequence, or this is fine? Fine. Okay, good, okay. So, you know, I'm also used to teaching MBAs. 
And MBAs have short attention spans. So they want to know where the, you know, how can I use it right away? Engineers, I think, are much more, uh, shall I say, patient and willing to learn concepts. Okay. So, so now we have, if you have multiple coefficients wi, right, wi hat, right? These are the predictors, right? Now each of them have a standard error associated with it, SBJ. Anybody knows what a standard error is? Yes? No. Well, should I give her dinner? No. T. T? Uh, yeah. Is it the um, standard deviation of the Gaussian distribution? So if you go like one standard error away, yeah. last. Yes. But but uh, yeah, the, the, you have standard deviation. Uh, but what uh, but what is the standard error? Right. You have a, so you have an estimated coefficient w i hat, right? So it's an estimate. So you're thinking of standard deviation in connection with that estimate, right? And that's the standard error. I'm saying standard deviation is for any random variable. But if I now have a prediction, I'm always thinking of errors in the context of the, of the prediction variable, right? And so I'm estimating this w i hat, right? So the standard error is associated with that uh, prediction variable or coefficient, right? So. Now, what we are looking at is, is this coefficient wj hat 0 or not? The null hypothesis is that the coefficient is 0, whereas the, uh, the hypothesis we are considering, the alternative, a is for alternative, right? Is, is this not 0, right? Why do we care about it? Because you want to see number of years spent in the mines. Do they or do they not influence whether the disease is serious or not, right? If the coefficient is 0, number of years don't make a difference. If the coefficient is non-zero, the number of years make a difference, right? So this ratio of this, uh, the, when you divide this, uh, the, the, the coefficient by the standard error SBJ, this is called the wall statistic. And the associated p-value indicates the statistical significance of the predictor xi, right? That's a standard sort of thing, right? No big news. Correct? Everybody with me? Or everybody says they've learned prediction. Uh, regression, right? No worries? Yeah? Okay. Any doubts? Come back. Pranava, I've volunteered you. For people who have doubts about R or about any of these, I said, you can help them. Okay. Um, now, next question. This is an interesting topic. A little, okay, now we've got our mathematical muscles up and limber and, you know. Okay. Another question. I'm going to ask you to tell me I've got two classifiers, and I'm going to ask you to tell me which is better, right? So what do classifiers do? So I've got light beer drinkers, I've got uh, dark beer drinkers. Classifiers looks at uh, Ray. The Ray has a sunny disposition. He must be a light beer drinker. But Ray goes off on vacations, maybe to Bermuda, and he's gotten used to this very thick, heavy German beer. So false. So, so in other words, he, we, we predict he's a light beer drinker, but he's actually not, right? So that means I'm, I'm misclassifying somebody who's a dark beer drinker as a light beer drinker, right? So, what, so that's one type of uh, misclassification, wouldn't you say? Okay, another possibility is I look at Pranava and I say, look, boy, this is a young, I, I always say young kid, I apologize, young man. Uh, and say, he is going to drink the thickest, heaviest beer. But Pranava has got a very level-headed fellow, and he drinks light beer, right? So, so, uh, so what type of error is it, right? So it was actually, he is a light beer drinker, I'm calling him a dark beer drinker, right? There are two types of errors, right? So we're going to look at those. Now, either case is bad. Now, and I gave you an example last time in semiconductors. If I say a process is in control when it's not, I lose a million dollars. When I say, hey, all, you know, it's out of control, when actually it is in control, people scurry around, I lose some time, but it's not a disaster. It's not a million dollars, right? So there's the asymmetry, right? So when we look at all these classifications, we need to think of this. When we think of a classifier, right? We need to think of which, what are the characteristics of a classifier which are important, right? Now, so, you want certainly, uh, when you look at a, a classifier, you certainly want 
to spell out the parameters of a classifier, right? In the logistic regression, these coefficients w or the prediction w hat was what characterized the classifier, right? Now you so uh, when you you also want uh, the you want to be able to com to compare two classifiers so that you come up with the best classifier possible, right? Between the two, you want to choose the better one. But overall, amongst the set of classifiers, you want to find the optimal one or the best one, right? But if you can't find the optimal, if I've just given n classifiers or some set of classifiers, how do I compare each one with the other to say this is better than that? It makes sense to you? Okay. So the criteria are being reasonable, accurate, and cost measures, right? Let's look at them. So what do you mean by being reasonable? Let's assume I know the area, right? As a doctor, I know that um, if I see the onset of sepsis, maybe, I see certain conditions prevailing, right? Like our flu, maybe a runny nose, itchy, whatever, some combination, right? So if, now, if the algorithm is not giving me the relationship which I know is true from the domain, hey, there's something goofy about the algorithm. Right? So, you need, so in fact, yesterday, sorry, I was at a convention of about 185 people yesterday uh, who are all looking at healthcare analytics. They're all trying to do startups in healthcare analytics. And the buzzword is predictive analytics. Data mining, prediction, that's the hot buzzword. So the, the, the point somebody was making is we had a panel of CEOs. You know? So one guy says, well, I, you, so there's the issue of machine versus human, doctors predicting. So he says, you know, people started laughing when he said, you know, the machine is pretty good, right? I mean, people think, you know, one of them said, you know, I never trust the machine without the doctor's inputs, which is true, right? That's reasonableness. And that's the point I wanted to refer to here. But a side point is, another guy says, another CEO says, you know, but these doctors, uh, let me tell you, there, there are doctors and doctors. And you go to the emergency room, the, uh, the probability of uh, misdiagnosis is apparently 20%. Yes, so don't go there, <laughs> right? So, so he was claiming actually sometimes algorithms can be better. But anyway, that's a, uh, uh, that's a, but you have a good expert, right? So then you need to be able to go by the expert. Now, also, in, 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 are these predictive variables actually available in future for the prediction? Because maybe I show a dependency, but I don't have that available in future, right? By the way, the, I, I actually ran across this problem myself because we were looking at brain injury monitoring with a colleague at UCSF. Now. But you put probes in somebody's brain to look at the cranial pressure only when somebody has had an accident and is serious. No, otherwise, nobody in the right mind would put some probe in their head, right? So this makes for problems because there's no benchmark. So, you, so there's some interesting, tricky issues when you do data mining. Now, if the classifier implies a certain order of importance, right, amongst the variables, so, uh, 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 this is a good question, by the way. This is a question that I got beaten up by this, uh, this guy from... Um, from eBay, who had this operations research degree from MIT. So our p-values, right? But now we already said here, here's a random variable. We figure out whether zero or not, how far from zero, uh, using a p-value, right? So it looks like, hey, if this is far away from zero, this should be a strong variable, right? So hey, I'm going to rank order all these variables based on the p-value. And is that order reasonable, right? Now, anybody gives me the correct answer, and I did bring it up last time, so you must know the answer, at least you are wide right awake. Uh, going by p-values is correct? No. Melissa says no. Okay, how many people agree with Melissa? Okay, Akshay agrees, uh, Evan agrees. Uh, uh, wait, 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 no, no, I'm not Thai, no. Uh, I know the last part of it is Chai. Yes. Tan Chai. Yes. Not bad, I'm getting it, slowly. I, so I, I sort of think in pictures, okay, got it. Okay, a lot of people agree. Okay, okay, then I won't make it too much of a puzzle. So what would you use to rank order things, right? We'll come back to that. I mean, you know the answer, we'll come back. Uh, but so this is a reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable criteria, right? Now, this is the point we'll be uh, being to look at a little bit more here. Uh, the accuracy measure. What do you mean by the accuracy of a classifier? Because for prediction, we have the uh, root, me uh, root mean square error, right? Because least squares, that does our objective. Okay. But here, the accuracy measure is, the idea is to compare the prediction with actual responses, right? For example, forecast errors in time series, or residuals in uh, regression models, and so on, right? So there, in the regression of time series, we can always look at actual values, predicted fitted values, and so on, right? 
However, when we do classification, we have the equivalent of that. Uh, we're not plotting them with, there we, uh, with time, we said how much is the error, right? We plotted it. But here we have something different because we are predicting a class. And let's look at what happens. This is called a classification or a confusion matrix. And we'll see why in a moment, right? Uh, and this can be done either for the training and or the validation set. Everybody is clear about what is the training set, what's the validation set? We have a training data, and you fit your classifier, and everything is on the training set, including predictions. But hey, you already know it, right? You can compare the predictions you made with what actually happened. But in future, when you predict, you don't know ahead of time, right? You predict, and then you really see, did it happen or not, right? That's the validation set, or the test set. OK. So this is a core idea of uh, the uh, issue of uh, the classification of confusion matrix. Oh, what did I have? Oh, OK. No problem. OK, you said professor needs a break. Maybe we can go drink some, get a drink of water and come back while you do this. I'll be back in a moment. OK, so resuming. Uh, OK, folks, back to class. So uh, the classification confusion matrix, you have two groups, right? two classes, and you can generalize it. But, uh, so you have C1 and C2. On the y-axis, we actually have the actual class, C1 and C2. right? And we always say y, the output, is a class, right? C1 or C2. And the predicted class is on the along the columns or the x-axis, y hat equals c1 or y hat equals c2, right? So that means <coughs> you can have a situation where out of a total of a plus b plus c plus d cases, a 
you correctly predicted that what was a class C1, Y, was actually also uh, uh, predicted at Y hat to be C1, right? Correct, life is happy. However, you had B of these where they were actually C1, but you predicted that it was class C2. So this is called what? A false? Hmm? Hmm? Negative. Right? Because you, sorry, it was actually C1. But you predicted C2. Correct? So, so let's see what a false positive is. Let's assume I have something which was y equals C2. It's another class. But I predict it to be class 1. Is that a false positive? Right? So the first one was false negative, the second one was false uh, uh, positive, right? And D is again a happy situation. So now, if I look at a classifier, so I, I'm just, uh, here's a summary, right? So now, the way we'd use it in a case like the beer preference, right? Typically, we, we have the cutoff for the probability value of success, remember? We, we have this probability we're predicting, right? Is it light, or, uh, uh, light beer or not? And you can choose 0.5, makes reasonable sense, right? Anything which is more, greater than 0.5, hey, it's likely it's light beer and below that, okay. But if I do that, because I, so the notice that that threshold can be changed, right? If I change that threshold for at 5, 0.5, here is a situation where here is a regular drinker who was predicted to be regular, those are 27 data points. Here's a regular who was predicted to be light, right? And uh, when, so if that's a misclassification, what is that called? False, negative. And here, a light beer was actually, uh, sorry, a dark beer, a light beer was called a dark beer, right, a regular beer. Okay, false, negative. Okay, so this is the classifier, right? So the question, of course, is if these numbers keep on changing, if the total data points remain the same, but they're relabeled, how do I know which is a better classifier, right? That's the question. Okay. So here are some five very popular measures, which also make sense, right? They're popular because they make sense. The overall accuracy is very simple, right? I predicted A of these correctly, class one belonging to class one, D of these correctly, class two belonging to class two. I predicted B and C uh, belong to the wrong classes. So the overall accuracy is, look at what is correct, A plus D. I look at all the A plus B plus C plus D, and it tells me how many times I'm right, right, or percentage. This is called the overall accuracy, okay? Now the overall error rate is one minus the overall accuracy. Make sense? Now the base accuracy of a data set is the accuracy of the naive rule. What is the naive rule? Out of anything, we pick the largest number belonging to a class and label everybody the same way, right? So if you do that, the, the but, so what you say is if I took a population of 100, of these 70 were blue, or 70 for light. So I say the probability of uh, anything being a, 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 a light is 0.7, right? Now the base error is the one minus base accuracy. Now, the last concept is very important. Anytime I have a classifier, how do I know how well it's performing? Right? Any performance improvement is respect to base, right? So here we said there's a base accuracy and a base error rate, right? So if you say, look, I used the classifier, and I looked at the overall error rate after I used the classifier. Now let me look at the base error that I started with minus the overall error because of the classifier. And I divide that by the base error, right? You can look at it as base error by base error is one. One minus overall error by base error, right? So one minus the error due to the classifier by the original error. The larger, the smaller the error due to the uh, base error, right? The way the results keep on getting better and better, right? So you get towards 100%. So that's the goal here, correct? So this is called the lift or the improvement of a classifier. So a very quick point is, 
if uh, you know you're predicting say bankruptcy you have two classes c1 and c2 you're predicting bankruptcy so the 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 importance of correctly or incorrectly predicting them could be very different right because if i say hey i'm going to invest in a bank and it's going to be bankrupt versus hey everything is hunky dory well believe me i don't want to mess up in predicting that right by the way this is a very real thing all of you maybe your parents had money in bank accounts or something right I, bil I, I did look at the FDIC regulation on whether our money would be protected or not during this whole thing that happened a few years ago, right? So that really makes a difference, right? So, so you cannot really look at the overall accuracy where you count everything equally. You want to look at the false uh, positives and false negatives with different costs and weights, right? Okay, so, uh, the, so are the characteristics of how to evaluate classifiers coming through clearly? Right? Marco, you're fine? Yeah, fine. This is all fine. Okay. Okay. So now, so if you have uh, the accuracy measures for the unequal importance of groups, right? How do you handle that? Well, let's assume C1 is an important group and C2 is not so important, right? Then, in that particular case, what is going to happen is that the sensitivity of the classifier is its ability to correctly detect the important group members, right? So A by A plus B, that's all you care about here, right? Okay, because all you care about is everything uh, that is being predicted, A and C are actually, uh, uh, sorry, I take that back, A by A plus B. A and B are actually, they belong to class uh, C1. A is labeled correctly, B is mislabeled, right? So A by A plus B. Now, similarly, if you want to look at the other population, which is the class 2, right? So D by C plus D is the specificity, which is the C2 members, right? So you, you have this sensitivity and specificity, right? Now, finally, we get into this false positives and false uh, negatives, right? And remember, for, uh, false negative is B because we... Uh, we, we predicted that this was t uh, class two, but it's actually class one, right? So we lost out. So it's false, po uh, false negative, because we just missed it out. Whereas in the case of, uh, so that's why we get, get B by B plus D. On the other hand, the false positive rate of a classifier, if you look at C, C is the value of something which was actually two, but it was predicted to be one, correct? So that's a false positive rate, right? So you get C by A plus B, right? Yeah. Would it be, um, if you ever look at, like, say, C over A plus C plus D, then if you, like, if you fix the false negative rate there. C, C, by, C by A plus? C over, say, A plus C plus D, or something like okay. that. C by A plus what? A plus C say plus D. Plus D. Ah. Say, say if you fix the false negative rate. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, so, so yeah, yeah. You, you could think of different measures, uh, uh, you know, it sort of what makes sense in your, in your context, right? Ultimately, it goes back to wh what makes economic sense or business sense. Right? Now, so, so actually, talking of what makes economic sense, so this is a big issue. There are the statisticians, there are the machine learning people, and there are business people. And they're all different. So statisticians always care about, am I doing least squares prediction, maximum likelihood? I don't know, for the past 50, 100 years, it's sort of the set, you know? Now, very good, but may not always be useful for us. Any idea why? Okay, let's look at least squares error, right? But at least, who says least squares is a good objective function? Uh, uh, so in inventory models, right, if I have backlogs versus, uh, uh, backlogs may be much more expensive than holding inventory, right? So you have something asymmetric. So your estimation may need to be different for those cases, but statisticians don't care. So in this particular case, you've got actual class and the predicted class, and you've got the true positive, the false negative, the false positive, and the true negative. When 
Positive is class one, negative is class two. So machine learning methods usually minimize the false positives plus the false negatives. The direct marketing guys maximize the, uh, uh, the, the true positives. So you can see how <laughs> you know, what you care for is different, right? So that's important because most people, my, my PhDs, I had to keep on mentioning this to them because they're so used to the literature, they start writing things out or don't even write out the objective function. So I tell them, hey, think of the objective function, think of the objective function. It really is different and important. Okay. Now, uh, let's see, what else we, do we have? Oh, the, the last thing is, uh, what I said uh, is really cost sensitive learning, right? That different things cost different amounts of money. So in, in, in the previous things, we just said A, B, just number of times something was wrong or misclassified. Here, maybe if you had, somebody had leukemia and you misdiagnosed, by golly, you're going to have a lawsuit, right, apart from losing a life. Uh, well, if you want to approve a mortgage, guess what happened, of course, uh, in the mortgage crisis, of course, they, they, they threw the rule book away and threw the classifiers away. But if you did have a classifier and you did it wrong, right, that's expensive. Web mining, a little cheaper, but we'll X click on this link. Well, it's not. Promotional mailing. We'll expire the product, right? Because you're going to say I have a nice brochure, colorful, spent a, a dollar or ten dollars, and you know, somebody's going to chuck pictures in the waste paper basket with high probability. Why bother to do it, right? So you're going to get all these right in terms of cost sensitive learning. So, um, uh, so, so this is merely telling you that the traditional methods ignore costs. And you can, the ways of accounting for cost-sensitive learning could be to resample instances according to cost, right? It's essentially you're weighting them differently uh, or, uh, or weighting them by cost and so on, right? So essentially you're trying to somehow account for cost, so either in the probability or in the weight. So lift charts, you need to figure out how to compute them. I'm going to skip this for right now, but if you have difficulties, come back to me. By the way, there are a couple of books which are a little easier than the textbooks I've given you. Uh, there are tougher books and easier books. There's a nice business sort of oriented book. So that's easy because they make, it's meant for MBAs, so they make life easy for everybody. But they don't teach the theory. That's the problem. But we have that. So uh, I'll skip uh, how to construct a list, list, uh, lift chart. So this is important, but uh, you, should, you should be able to fix it out yourself. Uh, le let me skip this uh, ROC curves as well for right now. You can come back to the necessary. Okay, this is an important idea whenever we do these predictions, cross-validation. So let's assume I have a lot of data. This is a big issue in data mining. I've got a thousand data points, right? Now, before I go to new data, I want to figure out with the thousand data points, I want to divide this in all data sets are typically divided into three, uh, three pieces, right? One is called the training set. The other is called the validation set. The third is called the test set. Test set is brand new. I'll predict. I don't know ahead of time what the answer is, and somebody will tell me whether it's right or wrong, right? Okay. The training set is, hey, I took the training set, I fit the model, right? Uh, I think of all of uh, data mining as I have some x's, I'm predicting y's, I'm fitting that function. That's all data mining. So the validation set is, if I, out of a thousand data points, I only used 800 to fit the, 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 the parameters, I'll try it out on the remaining 200 to see how well it's working, right? Everybody with me? Now, the question is, if I have a thousand data points or some number of data points, should I use only 1% to train and 99% to validate? Should I train on 99% and 1% to validate? 50-50, what should I do? Everybody with me? Okay, now, these are all real, very real world issues in data mining, right? What do I do? What do you think? By the way, Silicon Valley said you're quiet, all humming along nicely? Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, uh, what, what would you do? But by the way, Chuni, who's at the other end, he has dealt with all these issues at Cisco. He's dealing with them still. Uh, Chuni, yeah. sometime it'll be nice to have you come out here, to, or maybe along with Sri from Cisco, to talk about all the difficulties in trying to predict and uh, use these methods with very little data, right? Okay, okay good. So, yeah. That's right, which falls under my grandmother told me so. 
And the question is, why did my grandmother? Uh, it could be that my grandmother was right, but why? Right. I mean, so by the way, uh, since we've done talked about central limit theorems in the past, right? How many data points do I need to approximate? A, if I wanted to use a sample, right? Data points, and I want to say, hey, I want to take the uh, average expected value, and use a normal approximation. How many data points do I need to do that? Anybody knows? My grandma told me 30 data points. 30. Ah. Grandmother told me it ranges from 6 to 20. No matter how many, the more messy the distribution, the closer to 20, the better behaved and more uniform the distribution, closer to 6. Uh, to 6, 6, low end. If, if very nice, uniform looking distribution, 6. Messy looking things all over the map, 20. But again, this comes from experience and so on, right? So, but in statistics, if you have data, how do we do this validation? We actually have some pretty good methodology. It's not that ad, ad hoc. And that is called cross-validation. So any conference you submit a paper to, if you don't do cross-validation, goodbye. OK? So, so it, it, because the idea is, in fact, I was talking to uh, Joel. Are you there at the other end? He's not there. But we are, we are working on some paper. And so this whole issue of what is a reasonable measure keeps on cropping up. How many data points? What's a reasonable measure? What's cro it, it comes up every time. So, so, so the, the validation set is clearly being set aside, right, to assess the predictive performance uh, of the classifier. Now, when data is scarce, right, you go for something called k-fold validation. So you split the data into k roughly equally sized uh, parts, right? By the way, Another thing, when we were talking to this company, CrowdScience, they have so much data, they said, hey, what's the big deal? We have so much, we, need, we don't need to use all of it. In fact, we need to subsample. Because using all of it is ridiculous. It's not meaningful. That's the other issue. Okay, but let's assume data is scarce, right? But data is scarce, not, uh, sorry, data is scarce. Yeah, okay. So when data is scarce, the question is, um, you split it into k equal, roughly equally sized portions. Uh, each one you fit a classifier, right? So, and you can uh, to the other. Uh, so, in other words, you use k minus one classifiers to classify the data in the left out part, right, remaining part. And then you can combine the misclassification errors resulting from the k minus one classifiers, right? Now, typically, you have k equals 5, 10, and so on. And if k is almost at n minus 1, right? You use all the data. So in other words, I'm using everything. I only have one data point I leave out to predict, right? That's called leave one out. Everybody with me? Now, a smaller k will give you an unbiased cross-validation estimate, but with higher variance, whereas if I increase k, you'll get the other way around, right? All of you know if I'm looking at averages of samples, if I divide by the number of samples, the larger the sample, the less the variance, right? So it's a bias, it's the bias variance straight off is kicking in here. Everybody with me? So these are all important things for you in real world situations. Because people say, hey, how many data points? Uh, is it enough for you? We are being asked these questions at Cisco, and we don't really have a clear answer. They say, hey, Ram, you know, we have, you are doing all this text mining. We've got uh, thousands of documents, sometimes millions. Okay, how many of these do you want labeled to give you as a good estimate? I don't know. Because it depends on the characteristics of the data. So we're telling them, look, we need some initial data set. We'll get some estimates based on that. And then maybe we'll get a better prediction next time. Right? Everybody with me? Okay. Wide awake? Not fast asleep? Okay. Good? Okay. Oh, by the way, we should be discussing projects as well, right? Uh, okay, let's just finish this case study. Because it's sort of, that, that's always the... So I actually got these, um, um, especially from the guy who worked with the Mint. Who, the earliest examples of using logistic regression on something large scale, the US Mint. So I spoke to him, got his papers, and we converted this into... So I sort of like taking research and converting it into classroom teaching. Because sort of. So uh, this guy, um, I wonder whether it's this one or something else I've gotten. Anyway. This was a spring 1996 mailing campaign. Have you all heard of HEL, H-E-L, home equity loans? Take the money out, look happy, and then maybe you're stuck with it paying the bank, right? 
It's called a H actually it's a nice thing. It's called a home equity loan, HEL, conducted by a major bank, Midwestern Bank, MWB, right? Now, any buyer or a responder is a customer who ended up taking the HEL and actually paying an interest on it. That's what banks are targeting you for, right? I'm sorry to say that when you go out and get jobs, you'll be helping banks do more of this, right? So target people who will become willing victims or suckers. So hopefully he's being pleased about it, meanwhile. Uh, so uh, the continuous choice uh, of concern is the year-to-date interest that the bank is expected to collect, right? So that's what the bank cares about. How much money do I make? So that depends on the size and the terms of the HEL, right? So the models that were built were based on three criteria, profitability, goodness of fit, prediction of accuracy. Okay? Now, the profitability is measured in terms of the resulting total profit or return for the target mailing and audience and uh, the average profit or return, right? Goodness of fit tells you how the model is capable of discriminating between the people who will respond or who won't respond, right? And so you, you see, in other words, some people say, yes, I want to take the uh, loan or not, they respond. And the other, hey, they actually give me money and they're profitable, right? Why are they profitable? Because maybe there's some transactional cost that they incur, right? So if, if, they don't, uh, if they don't hold the loan long enough, then I'm not very happy about it, right? Um, so in a binary ratio, this goodness of fit is the, uh, measured with the actual response rate, the ratio of the number of buyers captured to the size of the audience mailed, or the lift in the actual response rate by the, over a random mailing. Right? By using this, here's the improvement compared to random mailing or in the continuous model by the average actual profit to return per customer, right? Now the prediction accuracy is measured by the difference in the predicted profit or response measures versus the actual results, right? Everybody clear? Okay. So this is a spring 1996 mailing audience. By the way, this is very typical of data that the number of non-buyers is much greater than the number of buyers. There are very many situations, in fact, uh, we dealt with situations in Chuni, very often, relevant documents are a very small fraction of the total number of documents. Maybe you have a million documents, I care about five. So how do you use this, right? So this is included um, as the sample of the non-buyers and all the uh, buyers in the uh, uh, model training. Also, the, the log odds ratio should reflect this true proportion of the buyers and the non-buyers, right? So all these features need to be captured. Now, here's the data. So the training uh, data said, think of it, the responders were about 200. The non-responders were 15,000 people. So when you start looking at all these industry projects, uh, I like the one of the students had asked me, I think, he said, look, I can, I've, I've done a lot of examples with R and all that, but really what is real world is what I don't know. So you're going to be running on all this, right? What is noisy, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, all these issues. So the, so the total you have, the test, uh, you have about 100 responders out of uh, 7,000 non-responders, which is very different, right? And the, uh, right, because the training, the ratio is 2 to, uh, to, what is it, 2 to 14, where the test is 1 to 7, right? Okay. So, okay, how do we do it? Our friend logistic regression, bango. And uh, we changed the loss function to detect the bias correctly, and the profit and the accuracy of the model were uh, calculated. So you, you can look at the leisure, but look at all the data, uh, data, right? The response probabilities, the cumulative audience you'll get for each of these, the deciles, the actual profits, right? So this is really giving you the whole characteristic of your predictor, right? Uh, so maybe you can study, study it leisure and come back to me. But, uh, so finally, the loss function depends on which class is more important to detect, right? As we've discussed before. And the accuracy you want to achieve and the profit you want to make, right? That's it. So unfortunately, I have finished last lecture, logistic regression. I have not quite managed to get to today's naive base or nearest neighbor, which we'll have to postpone. But let me start, but now you have a hammer. Now, by the way, knife base is a tricky subject, so we'll give you some readings for next class. And it's a very powerful approach, especially for text and so on. So we'll try to guide you a little. It's a little hard. Don't uh, give up hope or heart. 
we, we'll cover a little bit more in class and we'll figure out. And, and, and even the, the paper we're going to post is a little dense. Even the PowerPoint is a little dense, don't worry. We'll, we'll try to do something about it. Now, what I'd like to do is I want to go back to projects. So let me tell you the crowd science project and how it applies to what we learned today. And by the way, we'll be learning several more techniques for classification. And one of the approaches might be how does each of these techniques do compared to others on the problem? So okay, can you read the crowd science problem? So I'll, I'll define one problem they mentioned to me, and they may mention more. You want to take a look at it? Has everyone looked at it? When ready, say yes. Put up hands. So we'll start. So they have been very successful in not quite describing the problem, right? They tell you why they should be excited about their company, but not about the problem, right? So, so uh, one problem I'll tell you because I don't think it's such a big deal. The others, I think, it's better. They keep talking of look-alike and so on. So it's better for them to come and describe it, I think. So, so again, I want to go back to what I described at the beginning of class, when these guys think of the context. Uh, I keep forgetting to learn to use my um, my uh, well, tablet PC because then I can draw some pictures. I think that's a little bit better. I'm, I'm used to the document camera and multiple cameras being. Uh, I can use this and that and so on. Okay, so the problem is the following. I've got a website. Okay, I'm uh, crowdscience.com. I've got 6,000 sites associated with me. So customers can come to, users can come to any of these. Any given uh, website has got different segments. I'm trying to figure out what are the characteristics of people who come to me. And some of them sign up and they tell me their characteristics. So I, I already, as crowd science, I know what are the uh, characteristics or demographics of these people. So what I'm trying to do then is to provide feedback to the publishers with whom I'm associated with those websites to tell you, hey, these people came to your website compared to the others. These are younger women who are interested in perfumes and shoes but hate lipstick, something like that. You know? uh, so, so, so and also, by the way, they were interested in the graphics on your page, on this web page, not on that web page. They were interested in the text, not the graphics, whatever it is, right? So that's the sort of information they provide. However, often it's inferred because people may not be able to give you all this information. So the only way to calibrate is to actually ask the people who are on your website, hey, how much money do you make? At least, a polite way of doing it. They don't do it directly because people say goodbye, but a little bit more politely. And also, by the way, you might you be interested uh, these days in shoes or umbrellas, you know? So people apparently respond because they don't bug them. They, they stretch it out. They have some algorithms for doing all this right. So their question is very simple, very direct application, I think. If I have somebody coming up as a data point, so they say I've got, I don't know, every day I've got 100 potential victims. Sorry, not victims, but what other word is, okay. But, okay, I can, I'm gonna only choose 10. Now, which one should I choose? So if of, of 90 people, before I ask a question, if I can predict pretty accurately, and I know based on similar uh, uh, customers that I don't need to ask them because many of the features are highly predictable, right? Based on their features, then I won't ask them the question. Others, I will. So if you do this, it means they can prune off and save a lot of questions they're already asking and save their questions for a more, uh, or save for more effective questions or use their budget of customers more effectively, right? Everybody with me? So this is a direct application of what we've learned so far, and the rest of cl classification that we'll be learning can be directly applied. Everybody with me? Clear? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the so real question is, which of the customers can I make a prediction? But they may, they may want to ask them 20 questions. So maybe 19 questions you don't have to ask, only one you have to ask, because you can predict pretty accurately the remaining 19. So which of the questions should I ask or not ask? Or if a person has got many, 19 out of 20, I don't, uh, I'm, I don't have to ask. Why bother to ask this candidate? Ask another candidate where all 20 may be not quite clear. Right? So this is called informative data points. Right? How do I look for an informative data point? Right? By the way, this is a very interesting research problem in, of active learning in machine learning, which comes up all the time. So, 
uh, informative data points. Okay, so 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 uh, hopefully this gives you some sense of uh, how to use classification in CrowdScience.com. Now they will come and give you other problems, but yeah. Now, by the way, I think believe these companies are trying to uh, set up things uh, where uh, on EC2, everyone familiar with EC2? Amazon EC2? Okay, you're getting into data mining, right? So these days, everybody operates, not everybody, but everybody operates, or a lot of people operate in the cloud. So if I want something small, not massive large-scale production, but I'm trying to try out some idea, then you just go use a service provided by somebody in the cloud. So Amazon EC2 supplies that. So these guys are putting it up in the cloud so that EC2 so that we can run the algorithms and see with the data. But they want to be a little careful, right? They want all this proprietary NDAs. They want it to be supervised by me. This is supposedly a research project, so... So if folks are interested, that's one thing. So I'm, I'm going to give you a bunch of problems, and you can choose. These are a couple I'm telling you. We'll probably look at some medical problems as well, and so on. Okay. And I think Jimmy may have something on computational advertising. So we'll have a range of problems, I think. The other problem is, how are we doing on time? Not bad. We might actually get, we're getting disciplined here, right? Uh, start of class with all this telecast, the coordination is a little tricky, but now I think everything is a little bit uh, more autopilot mode, I think. Uh, so maybe all of you can take a look at this one. Uh, from This is called Serendio. The, so both these are related to social media, social media analytics. Right, that's a hot space right now, right? So uh, last year, the hottest companies funded were, uh, uh, were image and video advertising. In the next one, two, three years, they expect it to be social media and marketing analytics. So these guys have a bunch of, uh, uh, a lot of social media sites, right? Various blogs, forums, social networking sites, and reviews of products, right? So for six or nine months, they've done all this work. So they, they are actually able to give you, using their text analytics engine, because it's a very painful effort to do all this. The good thing about it is they've done the hard work. And they've got it all nicely captured, which makes life much happier for you. So they're asking, hey, can I look at all this and see is there any relationship between the social media and can you predict the pricing of commodities based on this? This is a nice uh, prediction problem, right? To do with our multivariate prediction. And maybe we need to do more, but we'll see. But Right? Now, of course, if they hadn't done all this pre-processing, it would have been text mining, blog mining, uh, because there may be some correlations and dependencies between the different blogs and forums and so on. So, so the issue might be that these random variables are correlated, right? So what is the difficulty here? Now, what have I not taught you in multivariate regression? It's all going to come up. And maybe we need to revisit that. If you have dependencies in the random variables, right, you have a whole bunch of things, a uh, bunch of issues you need to look at, right? And we want to go back to look at them, right? We need to look at uh, three or four things, right? Uh, heteroscedasticity, a whole, whole bunch of uh, variables, right? We'll come back to all that. Uh, so, you know, I'm doing the baby version of uh, prediction because you folks all said you're familiar. But at some point, we start hitting hard problems, we come back and revisit carefully, right? One big issue, which is still not very clear to me uh, at a research level just because of ignorance, is uh, which we are dealing with AOL. How do I attribute when I've got ads and I'm targeting ads and I want to look at the ads and say, if I look at the ad, I can predict uh, whether somebody will act or not. Is how do I, when I do these, uh, when I, if I cannot directly link this particular act to that particular action, I just have aggregate numbers, how do I get some measure of attribution? That's a key problem in uh, online marketing with multiple channels, and I don't know, I, I still don't have an answer. So, so some interesting problems. It's not like this is, you know, it's all done, life is happy, just going crank, but some interesting problems, I think, right? So this one, they're saying that you certainly need to know software, uh, which is of, like R, things we're learning here, right? And essentially, the, they want to, you to be, um, they're saying knowledge of text analysis, social media, and financial markets will be helpful, but not required. But statistical tools and correlation building is important. So you know what's important to them, right? And so both these will start in the next week or two and go through to the end of uh, May, right? May, yeah, May, that's right. And the midpoint check-in is, uh, I think, around about March. What are the dates we had? March, uh, March, uh, like March 17th or April 5th, right? And then uh, in, in uh, medical informatics, 
predicting which stage of the disease we are looking at, what sort of disease symptoms are novel, could be indicative of a new disease, those sort of problems might be there. And then uh, computational advertising, predicting ads and how well they do. So that's, those are the sort of projects we have. Uh, and there's another social media company right here in Berkeley. I guess they may have some other ideas. So, 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 so that's where we are. Now, if you want to do energy and you want to hit up some uh, Oracle or somebody, I remember talking, I was talking to a VP of Oracle about data mining of energy analytics. So I was interested in this whole issue of pricing, but then to dynamically mine and figure out how things are moving and then price. But anyway, the, we can look at that as well. We can explore. So, so hopefully, uh, uh, is this sort of, uh, so this seems like a good point to stop, and we have about two, three minutes. Uh, so is this pretty much consonant with uh, what you folks would like to try? How are things going? How about backbenchers? You've been a little quiet. Are you happy? Okay? Clear? On the math side. Getting pieces of it, the broader essence of it, but uh, not the complete logic. Ah, so, so you may need a little bit of, uh, well, Pranava is here, so uh, if uh, you want to uh, corner him in his busy, in his copious spare time of five art courses and so on, and uh, other things, but uh, he, right after class or set up a time, uh, I think he might be able to help a little bit, I think. Uh, and I, uh, I can be around a bit as well to help. Uh, so uh, who else is having difficulties with the mathematics? Raise hands. Come again? again the of oh, high school students. Uh, okay, the engineers can. Uh. We've we, we gone through this, I yeah. think, it's during the engineering time, but it's been. It's been a while. It's a bit of a gap. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I find that MBAs, uh, all, this is typical, I think, right? Because you're off working or doing something, so it needs a refresh. So typically what we have is boot camp. We, we sort of uh, load up people with all the statistics and all the, all the uh, tools and pieces separately so that you get caught up. But uh, yeah, OK, so if you could, uh, you need help, let me know, and we can work out something. But I think probably would be a good start, I think. So I, we can help otherwise. Uh, I, I don't mean to impose on him, but he's a kindly soul. So. Uh, okay, uh, uh, or you know, maybe should we wait four to five or some other time, or you, you know, so you, let me know. Yeah, and all, that's why I try to give so many assignments so that you can start trying out. And uh, nothing like trying out in data mining, right? You go try it out. But I can also go step by step. One possible thing is use this room, go through the slides, go through each one. Just take a little bit more time. Not everybody needs to. If they know it, they don't need to get bored. But we can focus on you. I, I'm happy. I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably. How about the, the rest of you? How are you doing? Doing fine? Grand. Grand, grand. Good. I like that. Grand. That's a good word. Okay, that's good. Uh, now, um, so, so uh, in terms of projects, uh, do you think by in a week or two you'll be ready to start uh, working on them, or what do you think? Uh, who are the people who want to spend some time on the projects? One, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, so, so we'll start lining you up with the companies when they come up, I think. So, so uh, anything else? Uh, so by the way, since we have exactly a minute, uh, are you uh, fine with the course? Anything else you want me to do? Change it now? No? Everybody's happy? Good. This is what you're looking for? Good. We want to be well trained. Do you know that book, the TSK book? Is that, huh. is that in the library? Ah, in the library. That is the issue. Uh, I don't know. I'll ask. Uh, Ray, do you know uh, whether uh, the any of these books are in the library or uh, I don't? This one is it is there. Okay, apparently it is there. Yeah, uh, yeah. And also, by the way, this is a wonderful book for people who have some patience. Analyzing multivariate data is an amazingly nice book with the geometry of the whole problem and linear algebra and very practical problems all solved out, all consistent. Uh, this one I would suggest holding off. <laughs> this is the Bible. But I, w I would hold off till uh, a, a little bit more advanced, I think. This, as uh, Ray has pointed out, uh, Veka. For you guys, Veka may be an easier tool. I don't know. Uh, so, so this is actually almost like teaching yourself Veka as you go along type of thing you can download from the web. So that's the other thing that might be easier for you guys, I think. Right? So, so, uh, so, so that's the uh, other one. I think. This is very easily available, I think. I don't know. I mean, is it on available online, Ray? Do you remember? Not sure. Okay. Uh, it is. It's uh, Witten and uh, Frank. Witten and Frank. Call data mining. Practical machine learning tools and techniques. Tools. Remember, tool. 
So he's got Vecca. The guys who use the Vecca thing. So it, it, they refer back to Vecca, the modules, and so on. So it's sort of nice. Uh, so, so it's just that what I found in my working with companies, if you don't uh, use R, it's sort of it's, it's become a staple diet sort of thing, you know. So that's why I'm using R. Otherwise, Vecca is the standard thing I used to use for students. So. Okay, good. Till next time then. And uh, by the way, please send me your feedback, any requests, anything you need. And also your projects and your, uh, remind, again, send me a short paragraph now that you've been in class for a while. But what are you hoping to get out of it in a little bit more focused manner, right? And how the class is helping or what else I could do to help you get there. Okay? Uh, by the way, so you need to start signing up not only for the project, which is the main interest, but also seminar presentations on different topics. So we, we'll, we, let, let's make some headway and then we'll get you signed up, okay? Good help, good. Hey, email about what you mean by seminar topics? Yeah, 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 I'll, I'll start doing all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Aha. <sighs> uh -huh. So by the way, uh, do you know uh, these two uh, young people, uh, Ray uh, Pranava, and this, uh, uh, and this is uh, Akshay. I'm sorry, I just, you know, hey. I brought you something. So